work on its ethical hacking team. I'm a part-time PhD student at UCL. Um, my previous role before PwC was leading an R&D team in a, a law enforcement agency, and previously spoken at DEF CON, BrewCon, 44CON, uh, and so on. So uh, what I'm gonna cover today is the concept of delayed execution, uh, particularly in malware. Um, time lock puzzles themselves, what they are and how they work. Attack, defense, uh, countermeasures, and then sum up with a conclusion. I will kind of caveat this whole talk by saying that uh, I'm not a cryptographer uh, or a mathematician at all. Um, my first degree was in English language and literature. Um, so definitely not an expert on this stuff. I'm just kind of interested in, in unconventional attack vectors and, and kind of manipulating the properties of, of things uh, to have an effect. So delayed execution is, uh, as the name suggests, deferring the execution of an application of a binary uh, until a predetermined time has passed. And that can either be kind of normal time, uh, minutes, seconds, hours, or it can be CPU cycles or a certain amount of things that have happened. And the idea behind it in malware is to uh, wait out the analysis period of sandboxes uh, and emulators. They can only dedicate uh, an, a finite amount of time uh, to analyzing a particular unknown application, um, after which time they have to return execution to the user or to allow that file through uh, an endpoint filter um, or to just move on to the next file that, that has to be analyzed. And that period can differ. It can be anything from a few seconds to a few minutes. And there are other applications for delayed execution, why you'd want to do it as well. Um, so time bombs are a good example, logic bombs, that kind of thing. Um, and crucially, as I'll cover later, it's not just about evading security mechanisms. There are also benign uses for it, good uses for it. So anti-DDoS is one, and I'll, I'll kind of cover how that works a bit later on. So this is a, a really simple method of delaying execution. There's no cryptography involved. This is uh, how malware developers did it for a long time, and uh, some of them are still using this. You literally just call the sleep uh, Windows API function, and pass in an argument, which is the number of milliseconds, um, and then you have your uh, evil code execute after that. You can also have a, a conditional statement, so you can compare uh, the system timestamp to a hard-coded timestamp in the malware. And if those don't match, uh, or, or the, the target timestamp hasn't happened yet, then don't do anything, just continue sleeping and then check again in three seconds or, or, or whatever it is. So sandbox developers um, and antivirus developers and other people responsible for creating security mechanisms kind of got wise to some of these techniques. And they started doing things like manipulating the system time that was returned to applications querying it. Um, so, for instance, accelerating it. Um, so, this uh, pseudocode here simulates uh, a check for that kind of manipulation. So, uh, what we're doing here is getting a timestamp, sleeping for an amount of time, and then getting another timestamp, and then comparing the difference between the two. And if the difference is less than what we expected, um, then we're probably in some kind of sandbox or emulated environment. So the code will then not execute its originally intended methods, it will do something else. Uh, this is an example of just wasting time in, uh, in assembly. Um, so again, this is very simple, no cryptography. This would happen before um, the, the kind of main method of your malware. Um, and in this case, you just zero out the EAX register um, and you increment it by one and just loop around continuously until it reaches some kind of uh, predetermined amount. And similarly, a very simple example here uh, where you just load a library multiple times. So these are all kind of really simple methods. A little bit more advanced is the concept of remote lookups for timestamps. So rather than relying on system time, uh, in this case, the malware will get a timestamp from the HTTP headers of a server and compare that to a hard-coded uh, timestamp in the code. Um, and if that matches, then it will continue to execute the evil code, and if not, it will sleep and then check again. The issue with this is that you are relying, uh, firstly, on having internet uh, access at a sandboxed environment, which isn't always the case. Um, the internet access might be simulated, um, so sandboxes do that. Um, the WannaCry malware, for instance, um, relied on that as a check. So that non-existent domain that Marcus Hutchins registered was a check um, by the malware to see if internet access was being simulated. So here's a really uh, brief example of this. 
So what we're doing here is getting uh, date information from an HTTP server, and we're checking it as a hard-coded one, sleeping for a certain amount of seconds, getting another timestamp, comparing the two, and seeing if it's being manipulated. And then the second example is an NTP server, so just an alternative to doing it over HTTP. Now, normally you do this for more than 15 seconds, but uh, otherwise we'd just be kind of staring at a video for kind of two or three minutes. Now, where uh, I've kind of introduced some, some new techniques that I haven't seen before in the wild, um, but that, that could be used, is looking up external data rather than time. So what this pseudocode does is it uh, fetches a uh, response from the Australian government's website on the current population of Australia. And it compares the population count to some target population count, which is hard-coded in the malware. Obviously, there's an assumption that the population of Australia is going to increase. Um, but the crucial thing here is that you don't know um, how much it's going to increase by. It's not a kind of predictable uh, increase, uh, at least not, not the exact person. Um, but the, the um, statistics on that Australian government website are updated on a regular basis. So the malware can check every three seconds, it knows it's going to get a new value, and it can then compare that. Uh, the other example I've got uh, in this demo, as well as the Australian government, is checking the uh, block count uh, of Bitcoin. So check how many blocks of Bitcoin have been mined. Um, that is something that does happen on a predictable, regular basis. Right? There should be a, a new block around every 10 minutes. So this is the Australia example. And you can see, uh, very simple. Again, in this case, the, uh, the, the actual value is uh, uh, below our target, again, just to kind of save time. Uh, we don't want to wait for so many people to be born in Australia before the demo works. OK, so I briefly kind of covered this earlier. Sandbox capabilities, what sandboxes can do is they can manipulate system time they can manipulate values from external sources, and crucially, they can do something called multi-path execution. That's where you have a, a conditional statement in malware, and the sandbox can take both branches, uh, or more than one branch of that conditional statement, to see what would happen, um, regardless of, of whether the condition is true or not. So time-lock puzzles. Uh, time-lock puzzles are a cryptographic construct. Um, it's quite an obscure sub-branch of cryptography. Um, brief show of hands, has anyone heard of time-lock puzzles before? One, two people, I think? Okay. So the idea behind a time-lock puzzle is that it's a cryptographic puzzle and the solution to it is generated over time. Uh, sometimes it can be a kind of variation of a brute force attack, so it's essentially brute forcing itself. Uh, Timothy May um, of the Cypherpunks in 1992 kind of first suggested the concept, and then uh, Rivest and others in 1999 uh, implemented a, a practical um, uh, proof of concept. And the initial uh, intention behind time-lock puzzles was for them to be benign, essentially a kind of digital time capsule. Um, and the ideal time-lock puzzle, uh, as suggested by Rivest uh, and others, would be resistant to parallelization, um, to distributed attempts, and that kind of thing. Uh, other uses included uh, sealed auction bids. So your bid uh, for a lot at an auction wouldn't be uh, available until everyone had put their bids in. Um, releasing classified information after a certain period of time. Uh, and escrow for, for contracts. So this is um, a brief excerpt from the uh, implementation at MIT um, by Rivest uh, and others in 1999. So they have a, a, a kind of digital time capsule running uh, at the MIT uh, computer science department, which should decrypt uh, roughly 2033. Um, so it started in 1999, should take about 35 years to solve. So time lock puzzles for attack. So the kind of concept here is that you can achieve delayed execution, but without having to, um, to use conditional statements, without having to rely on timestamps or anything like that. So an example attack here would be you have some malicious payload. You encrypt it with a key, which has been generated with a time-lock puzzle. You don't hard code that key into your decryption stub. Instead, your stub has to generate that key by performing the same time-lock puzzle. 
um, and that key will then be generated after X number of cycles or loops or minutes. Um, if you're looking for minutes, it depends on kind of what algorithm you're using or what kind of construct you're using. Once you've got the key, you decrypt the payload, and then you can either run that payload in memory or write it to disk or whatever. And the benefits of this for attackers, um, for, for pen testers and red teamers and so on, would be that you negate multipath execution, uh, you negate that kind of system uh, manipulation of timestamps, obviously negate uh, signature detection because we're talking about encrypted content, you don't have to rely on any hard-coded keys in the malware for decryption. And uh, you also wait out that analysis period of sandboxes as well. The disadvantages of using it, um, depending again on what kind of time lock puzzle you're using, it can take as long to generate the key as it will eventually to, to generate it from the decryption stub. So you might be kind of sitting there for two or three hours or whatever, uh, waiting for that key to be generated. Um, there are heuristic markers for time lock puzzles, and I'll, I'll talk about that a bit later. And some of them will also be vulnerable to parallelization and, and distributed computing. So I'm going to show you some proof of concepts. Uh, the proof of concepts are uh, predominantly uh, string text-based, um, but right at the end I've got some actual uh, weaponized versions in macros and executables as well. So <clears throat> I'll jump straight into it with uh, a future timestamp. So uh, in this case, this is an encrypted, um, it's using a timestamp in the future to encrypt the malicious payload. And what the malware will then do is get a, a timestamp, either system-based or, or from a server. It will then try and use that as a decryption key. Uh, if it doesn't work, it will sleep for a certain amount of time and then try again. you'll uh, notice my really leak GUI skills here as well. Um, so here we're just taking some string, which is testing one, two, three. We're putting in some timestamp from the future, encrypting the data, uh, and then this malware will just try uh, once a minute to uh, fetch a timestamp from a server um, and try and use that as the decryption key. So I will skip forward for this uh, rather than making you sit through it. Okay, and then it then decrypts. The issue with this, of course, is that you're still relying on uh, data from uh, a remote source, which a sandbox could, could spoof or whatever. But this is um, less susceptible to things like multipath execution. Chained hashing. Um, so this is one of my favorite ones. With this one, we take uh, some seed text. It's just an arbitrary string or, or value. And then we um, hash it and then we hash the result, and then we hash the result of that hash, and we keep going for, in this case, 10,000 iterations, until eventually we end up with a, a final hash value. And we use that as the encryption key, encrypt the malicious payload with that. And starting from the same seed, the only way to, to get that eventual hash value would be to repeat the entire chain again. So uh, in this case, we're, we're going with 10,000 iterations again. That's the length of the chain. Uh, we just start with a, a random seed value um, and a string. And that eventually gives us some encrypted text. And then to decrypt the text, we need to repeat that chain. So we pass in the, the number of iterations, um, the seed value, and the uh, encrypted text, and that returns us the, the plain text. There are ways this could be, um, could be defeated. So um, if you have kind of uh, accelerated hardware, for instance, like a, well, like a, a Bitcoin mining um, rig or something like that, that could be probably configured um, to do this a lot quicker. Uh, brute forcing weak keys. So um, this works on the principle of layered encryption. So you have uh, some text that you encrypt with um, maybe three or four very weak keys um, in layers. Um, and then for uh, decryption, what will run on the, the, the victim's computer would be a, a brute force algorithm to brute force all of those layers of encryption. So in this instance, we uh, just need to pass in a string to encrypt, 
and then just some weak keys. In this case, they're, they're three character keys, um, three of them. That gives us some encrypted text. And then the decryption process will just brute force uh, all of those weak keys in sequence. Uh, until we then retrieve the plain text. So this technique has been used um, in some proof of concepts before. It's used on something called rcryptor. Um, a kind of similar version to it is used in Hyperion as well. Uh, repeated squaring. So this is the technique um, that's used uh, for the MIT implementation by Rivest and others. Um, so this is essentially um, trying to uh, do RSA factorization. So what we do with this one is we specify uh, two primes, uh, a difficulty value and the test string, and the string to encrypt. That then outputs uh, the uh, modulus of those two prime numbers. Um, we already know the difficulty value, which we have to use on the decryption side. Um, and a, a kind of a secret value or encrypted text. So we pass in those three things, the, the modulus, uh, the difficulty, um, and the secret value. And then repeated squaring is then performed um, on those until eventually we end up with the plain text again. A client server, so again this is uh, potentially subject to the weakness that you're relying on on some remote source. Um, but this one's slightly different. So in this case, um, you initially encrypt your malware uh, with a, a timestamp concatenated with some secret value um, which is stored on a server. Um, and you hash those together, use that hash key to encrypt your malware. And then what the client does every X minutes is it will reach out to that server and it will um, retrieve a hash of the server's current timestamp concatenated with that secret value to determine if the, uh, the decryption key is, is correct. So in this case, again, in the interest of, of saving time, the timestamp has already occurred, so it will decrypt instantly. Um, so this is the uh, encryption key. So it's just a matter of passing that to the um, uh, application and encrypting the plain text. And then this is what the uh, server will return to the malware um, when it updates. So it's, uh, again, the current timestamp concatenated with some secret value and hashed together. Okay, so that decrypts instantly in that case. But you could obviously set your timestamp to be a day or a week or a month in the future. Uh, chain pseudo random number generators. So this is very similar to the, um, the serial hashing um, concept. So again, you start off with some seed. In this case, it's uh, a, a number. Um, you specify a number of iterations. And then you run through a PRNG, um, starting with that value as the seed, um, and then repeat that. Um, and then eventually do something with that number at the end. So you could either concatenate them all together for the number of iterations you've got, um, or you could hash them or whatever, um, and then use that as the encryption and decryption key. So in this case, we have a seed of one, two, three, four, five. Um, we're gonna do it five times, five lots of 10,000 iterations, uh, and this is our test string to encrypt. This will then run through five lots of 10,000 iterations until we get a final value um, and then use that as the encryption key for the plain text. And then to decrypt it, you perform the same thing again. So all you need to know is the uh, initial seed value, um, the number of iterations and the encrypted text and it will then just repeat the, um, the sequence until you can decrypt the plain text. Okay, this is 
definitely my favorite one. So this is proof of work. This is based on uh, the same uh, algorithm that's used in Bitcoin mining. Um, so if you're not familiar with, with how that works, um, it, it's pretty simple. So you have uh, some target hash value and you select a certain substring of that hash value. And the, the length of that substring determines how long it's gonna take because what you're looking for is a partial hash collision for that substring. So in this case, it's three, it's the first three characters, which in this case is ABC. Um, and then you will hash some data um, plus a, a, non a nonce value. Um, and if the substring of the hash of the result matches the substring of the target hash, then you've won um, and you know, Bitcoins are mined. Um, if not, increment the nonce by one and then try it again and keep going and keep going and keep going. And if you still can't get it after you've exhausted the, the, um, the amount of nonces that are available, then you change something in the data. So the timestamp, for instance, and then start again. So uh, in Bitcoin, um, this takes about 10 minutes um, to find a solution. Um, here, we're doing something slightly different. We still have a target hash. We still have a substring. We're still attempting, um, our attempts are a hash of some data plus a nonce value. Um, but what we're using as the encryption key is the eventual uh, hash value, the whole thing. So uh, all we're doing here is we're specifying some plain text that we're going to encrypt and the length of the substring, which will determine roughly how long this will take uh, or how difficult it's going to be. That then gives us some encrypted text, and then to decrypt it, we just need to pass in the, uh, the, the cipher text um, and the difficulty again, and it will just repeat the function. So the really nice thing about this is that there are uh, multiple results, multiple hash values and nonces which will satisfy that substring condition, but there's only one hash value which is gonna work as a decryption key. So, um, if you're starting, you could start at like a nonce of 500,000 or 5 million or 5 billion or something like that. And you could very well easily get uh, a successful result, but it doesn't mean it's going to be the same hash value um, that you've used to encrypt. Um, because Bitcoin mining and, and proof of work isn't, um, it, it's more of a lottery. So every nonce you try has got an equal chance of winning. Okay, so some practical applications. Um, so what I'm gonna show you now is proof of work as an executable stub, um, so actually bypassing antivirus uh, product. Then proof of work as a couple of VBA macros. Um, and then serial hash chaining of VBA macro as well. Okay, so this is as an XE stub. So in this case, our malicious payload is um, calc, uh, an MSF venom payload, which is obviously gonna trigger antivirus straight away. Um, we're going to encrypt that, so this would be on the attacker side. Uh, this takes about a minute. I will skip forward. And once this encryption process is finished, uh, what we end up with is a blob of encrypted data, which is the encrypted form of that uh, MSF Venom payload. So just to demonstrate, um, if you try and run that as an XE, it's obviously not gonna work. So what actually um, is gonna be opened by the victim in this case is the decryption stub. And what we're gonna do is add in that encrypted resource, uh, sorry, that encrypted blob of data as a resource to the decryption stub. So the decryption stub is gonna run exactly the same process, um, but once it um, successfully mines uh, the problem, it's then gonna um, decrypt the encrypted resource and run it in memory. Okay, so this is our uh, decryption stub, um, our new executable. So if we copy both of these over to a virtual machine that's just got um, a standard consumer antivirus product running on it, you can see MSF Venom gets blocked straight away and deleted as you'd expect. Uh, our decryption stub hasn't. If we scan it with the antivirus product, uh, it's not gonna find anything, obviously, because it's still encrypted at this point. Um, but if we run it, you can see it's gonna do exactly the same process.
So this is looking for a, uh, a partial hash collision of four characters in this case. It finds it and then runs the payload in memory. Okay, and this is uh, VBA macros. So this is a serial hash chaining and the proof of work thing. Um, so here, you'll be able to see it's the same payload, MSFN and PALC, uh, CALC, it's just been um, uh, customized for VBA. So this is the array of encrypted bytes, the encryption has already happened. Um, and you can see in the, the console window here, we're now um, uh, doing the, the hash chaining in this case, then pops up CALC. And this is the uh, proof of work demo. So again, we have an array of encrypted bytes. It's already been encrypted. And again, if you look at the console window, you can see it's then um, brute forcing those hashes. The uh, one issue with this, obviously, is that from the user's perspective, the, uh, the, the program seems to freeze um, when it's running. So uh, I don't know if there's a way around that, um, possibly, um, but that's kind of the, the one drawback of using it as a macro. Okay, and here are some um, wholly impractical applications um, that I haven't tried. Uh, much as I wanted to, I wasn't allowed to. Um, so you could use um, lasers, so you could shine a laser at the moon or something, and. Uh, time, the amount of time that the reflected laser beam takes to come back. You could wait for planets to align in a, a, certain, um, a certain way. You could measure the time of orbit for an arbitrary object uh, around a planet. You could measure bacterial growth, um, which will kind of vary obviously depending on conditions and that kind of thing. The one I really wanted to do and really wasn't allowed to do was to uh, look at uh, the half-life of different uh, radioactive materials combined together and wait for the ratio of them to reach a certain point. Um, but there, there are some massively impractical and dangerous ways that you could do time lock puzzles as well. Okay, so countermeasures for time lock puzzles. If an attacker is using a time lock puzzle in a piece of malware, what, what can be done about it? So I mentioned earlier heuristic markers, um, and there are some. Um, now I'm not um, an antivirus developer or a sandbox developer. I don't know kind of in, th in practice how difficult these would be to implement. Um, but some markers that definitely give um, things away as time lock puzzles would be obviously encrypted content, so some kind of blob of encrypted content. Um, dynamic key generation, so there's no hard-coded key and the key's not fetched from some remote resource. Uh, it's generated on the fly. Um, multiple failed decryption attempts. So most time lock puzzles will attempt to, um, as you've seen, kind of try and brute force themselves. Um, and then finally, not specific to time lock puzzles, but, um, but generally kind of process injection and process hollowing. Um, because obviously if you just write a malicious payload out to disk, that's still gonna trigger signature-based antivirus um, in, in some cases. There are um, cryptography attacks that you could deploy against time lock puzzles as well from an analysis side. So uh, parallelization is obviously one, um, distributed computing as well. Um, one potential um, technique you could use from a sandbox perspective is starting your analysis period after something is decrypted, which then um, kind of nullifies the whole point of someone trying to wait out an analysis period. Okay, so time lock puzzles for defense. So this has been kind of uh, suggested in a lot of literature um, over the last kind of 10 or 15 years. And it's a really interesting potential application to time lock puzzles, predominantly to do with DDoS mitigation. So the idea would be that um, you have a server, let's say it's a web server, that um, obviously accepts incoming requests and gives clients access to, to resources. Um, if the server becomes aware for some reason that uh, it's experiencing malicious traffic uh, or if it's experiencing an overload of traffic, it can then um, almost kind of switch on time lock puzzle mode. So with time lock puzzle mode, what um, the server would do would be to give every client requesting a resource uh, a time lock puzzle to solve. And it wouldn't be anywhere near as long as the ones I've shown you here today. It might take kind of three or four seconds, something like that. 
The client has to solve that and submit a solution to the server. The server then verifies it, and if it's correct, it will then allow the client access to those resources. Um, if the solution's incorrect, then it won't. Um, and you could kind of adjust the difficulty of those time-lock puzzles depending on you know, the client profile, what type of request it is, how many clients you have requesting resources, that kind of thing. Um, and crucially, you don't necessarily need to use it just for kind of HTTP, HTTPS DDoS attacks. You could use it for things like um, spam as well. So one of the first uh, implementations of proof of work was something called Hashcash. Um, anyone heard of Hashcash before? Show of hands. One, one person right at the back. Okay, oh, two people, okay. So Hashcash uh, is really interesting and it, it contributed a lot to the development of Bitcoin. Um, Hashcash was written by a guy called Adam Back um, in 1997. <coughs> uh, excuse me, and the idea behind Hashcash was to um, disrupt the whole business model of spammers. So the idea was um, everyone would have some kind of add-on plugin to their email client. And if you wanted to send someone an email, your client would have to compute a very, very short time lock puzzle, a proof of work. Um, again, it might take kind of four, five, six seconds, something like that. Once that solution had been generated, uh, it would be attached to the email or it would be inserted into the email headers. When that email was then received by the recipient, their email client would check the email headers for the presence of that solution, verify it at their end, and if it was correct, it would move it to the inbox. Uh, if it was incorrect or just wasn't there, it would put it into the spam folder. So um, the idea, the concept behind it was that for a legitimate sender, waiting four or five seconds to send an email is no big deal, but if you're a spammer, that throws out your whole approach. If you have to spend five seconds for every single email you're sending. Um, you could also use this technique for API requests as well. So it's um, something that we're starting to see as an attack vector for DDoS is um, abusing uh, complex API requests, particularly at the back end and kind of mid-tier API requests. So um, whereas kind of from the, um, uh, the client side, it doesn't look like anything necessarily um, you know, too intensive is happening, within the infrastructure, because of the amount of kind of interconnected requests that certain APIs have to make, it can cause uh, denial of service conditions on the back end. Um, so again, this is something that could be applied to that. So I mentioned Hashcash um, by Adam Back. Some other work that's been done around this, um, I've cited here. Uh, one particularly interesting one is um, uh, McNevin and others in 2004. So they suggested uh, well, they actually did as a kind of proof of concept, making changes to the, uh, the Linux kernel, to the TCP IP stack to actually uh, implement this. So when a device with an operating system tried to make an outgoing request, um, it would have to solve a time lock puzzle. So uh, I've got a really brief, uh, brief proof of concept um, for a defense time lock puzzle. It's really simple. Um, it only works at kind of um, a browser level, so clients requesting a particular page have to solve a, uh, a JavaScript puzzle and send that to the server. The server then has to verify that. So this is all uh, recorded from the client side, so you're not gonna see a lot. Um, but just to take you through it, the uh, client here is requesting a particular page. You can see the browser is hanging um, for you know five, six seconds and then eventually it's granted access and you can see the result of the time of puzzle in the URL bar. Uh, in this particular instance, um, that's not reusable. So if you then request the same page again, you have to complete the time lock puzzle again. And that's the, the idea behind that is to kind of stop an attacker then just sending that link around to everyone so they can all use the link and bypass the time lock puzzle. So benefits of using it for defense, um, Good for layer seven attacks um, and kind of uh, application layer attacks. So things like kind of exhausting um, uh, web application resources. Um, if it's done at that level, it doesn't hugely inconvenience, uh, inconvenience legitimate users and shouldn't, you know, regardless of whatever level it's applied at. Um, if you're a legitimate user, you, don't, you shouldn't mind waiting kind of four or five seconds, depending on what your use case is, of course. Um, you can automate it and here at least, relatively simple to, to actually implement. 
Some drawbacks of this approach is that the verification process itself can be a new DDoS attack vector. So an attacker can submit multiple incorrect solutions deliberately to cause denial of service conditions on the server trying to verify the time-up puzzles themselves. Um, there are ways that you could bypass it, potentially. Um, it gets pretty impractical at lower layers. Um, so you either kind of would have to revise TCP IP or kind of revise kernels or get everyone to agree to use a particular client, um, that kind of thing. Uh, one interesting possibility, um, which is purely hypothetical um, and purely theoretical, would be to uh, attach uh, a defense time lock puzzle construct to something like Brickabot. Um, so Brickabot is an IoT, uh, or was an IoT worm, um, that exploited many of the same vulnerabilities as Mirai and Reaper and those kind of things. Um, the um, purported developer of Brickabot, Brickabot um, claimed in a statement in January that the reason he launched it and the reason uh, he or she had launched it and attacked all those devices was to prevent vulnerable devices subsequently being used by Mirai and Reaper and so on. Because Brickabot would permanently brick vulnerable devices. It would try and upgrade the firmware to some kind of bad image um, or, or something similar, and those devices would then be permanently unusable and therefore not available for Mirai and Reaper and so on to, to actually attack. And that, that um, kind of concept is really interesting. Um, and there's kind of lots of ethical debates you can have about whether that's ever the right thing to do. Um, obviously, it's still legal, um, but, but um, you know, compared to those devices subsequently being used for Mirai and Reaper, is that preferable? It's, uh, it's a really gray area. But it kind of feeds into uh, a concept called nematodes or antiworms, um, which is something else I've been looking at recently, um, which is the concept of, of building worms which um, exploit the same vulnerabilities as malicious worms, but then will patch them uh, or prevent them being infected. So in terms of time lock puzzles, um, and again, purely hy hypothetical, purely theoretical, something like Brickabot, instead of um, permanently bricking devices, could implement some kind of time lock puzzle in those devices that would um, massively hinder their usability for subsequent DDoS attacks if they were infected. Um, it's purely kind of uh, completely blue sky thinking. That I'm sure there's all sorts of problems with it. I just thought it was an interesting idea. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, time lock puzzles are a relatively obscure area of cryptography. Um, and historically, uh, going all the way back to 1992 when they were first, uh, first suggested, uh, it's all been about the benign uses of them. Um, in offensive security research, they've been very much underexposed. There have been some people looking at it. I mentioned Rcrypta. Uh, there was a paper on um, uh, a Python framework that you could use for anti-emulation. In my opinion, I think it's, it's really important that, that vendors and defenders start to look at uh, time lock puzzles and how they could be kind of misused. Um, a problem is that they are very difficult to identify and detect. Uh, to my knowledge, um, they haven't really been seen in the wild yet, um, other than malware that's created with the likes of Hyperion, Rcrypta, that kind of thing. Um, the literature goes into a lot more detail about their possible applications for defense, um, albeit those aren't always practical. But there are some really interesting applications for defense and for deterrence, um, particularly when combined with other measures, uh, but still a very underexplored area of research. And I've, um, when I was kind of researching this project, yet to kind of see a, uh, a really practical way that this could be applied for defense. So um, some future research that, that I'd like to do and um, I'd like to invite you to think about as well if you're interested is coming up with more variants of time lock puzzles. Um, so some of the ones that I showed you earlier were, were novel, some of them were based on um, you know, the work of others, so Rivest and others, for instance, the repeated squaring one. But I think it would be really interesting to see if we can have some more variants of time lock puzzles. Um, I think it would be awesome to get some more realistic applications for defense and some more realistic proof of concepts. Uh, and I'm sure there are people in this audience and in the community who, who would be kind of far better suited at doing that than I am. Um, prevention and detection is a crucial thing, so if you have kind of ideas for how time lock puzzles could be prevented um, and detected, um, that would be really interesting. And I think just from a, a kind of societal point of view, um, other uses for time lock puzzles um, would be really interesting. So I, I went through some earlier 
um, you know, time capsules, sealed auction bids, release of classified information, that kind of thing. But it would be um, really cool to see if there are other ways that this could be used beneficially for, for society as well. So thank you very much. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch, that's my Twitter handle and my email address. Um, feel free to drop me a line and any feedback or comments. Uh, if you're interested in doing some stuff on time lock puzzles, um, I think I have about five minutes for questions. Um, so happy to take any. Thank you very much. So, yeah, it, that's a really interesting question. So, um, so we have used this technique before for some of our red teaming stuff, um, and we typically set it for kind of 20 minutes plus. Um, one actually, on, on that subject, one really interesting possible method of detection is looking at the amount of CPU cycles um, for a certain period of time. Um, and that's obviously something that's also being looked at for crypto jacking malware. Um, so you could certainly look at CPU usage, but typically, yeah, we've set it for kind of 20 minutes and above. Um, we don't try and set it for anything kind of more than 30 minutes, just in case something uh, overheats or something like that, um, but yeah. Do I think you've got uh, one at the back? Hey, good talk. Um, so, not really a question, but um, an idea for a time lock puzzle. Um, invalid JavaScript syntax. So, create um, a puzzle based on, um, you, ba you basically mutate the code so it produces invalid syntax, and then the, um, the server knows the answer, um, and then at the client side, you brute force the JavaScript code until it contains valid sy syntax, which will return the um, the correct um, password code, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That that's really cool. Um, so that that would work. Yeah. That's really cool. Hold on. All right. Thanks very much.